How many of you uh, <clears throat> came all the way from Maui to be here this morning? <laughs> There's one. <laughs> I came from Bahamas. So oh. Well, so. I don't think Kevin wants to introduce his sister. Do you? Do you, could you? Would you introduce your sister, everybody? <laughs> We're glad you're here. I think uh, given the conditions and stuff, I think most of us would trade with you. We're, uh, Are they going to let you back? That's right. I, and before I get started this morning, I, I just kind of wanted to also say I'm, I'm glad to have a president who calls uh, on a day like this as a day of prayer. Um, Listen, we, we have nothing to fear. Are you with me? Yep. What's the worst thing that could happen to you? If, if COVID-19 takes you down, then sudden death well, is sudden glory. Amen. So you know what? Let's just go on doing things the way we do them. Uh, you know, I, I think it's smart, as Bob was saying a minute ago, I think it's smart that we, uh, that we don't uh, get carried away with hugs and kisses and... Uh, Eskimo noses, as Mark was saying a few minutes ago. So we, yeah, there's some things that we don't need to be doing, but uh, at the same time, I think we can uh, we can be smart about it. Um, we have no fear. You know, how many times in Scripture does does the Lord tell us to fear not? So we don't fear, and uh, we're moving on. But I am glad, and I hope you'll join me sometime during the day. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll certainly close this with prayer. In a, in a little bit, and then we'll, we'll have the Lord's Supper and all that. But let's just be in prayer for the, the men and women who are leading this, uh, what's become a defense, if you will. And, um, and so just, just be in, in prayer for that throughout the day. You know, we, there were a lot of people who canceled church this morning, and, and, and you're here. And uh, so uh, I'm grateful for that, and I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad that... Uh, that, uh, that we're keeping our doors open uh, for the time being. So that said, um, open your Bibles, please, to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, we're just going to read verses 11 through 15. Chapter 2, 11 through 15. Would you, when you found your place, would you stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of the Word of God? <coughs> For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we, we, we just want to lift up the men and women who are leading this uh, defense of the, the disease that's, that's floating around. We're just thankful for the fact that we have our hope in you. We put our trust in you, not only for salvation, but for everything that we do. Because we know that you are the great sovereign, that you are the one true God. We just ask for your intervention in this time of need. We pray now as we open your word, we study, we want to hear from you, Father, and pray that you'll receive the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. One of the primary purposes of the church of the living God is to share the gospel. Another a better way to define the gospel is the good news. That he has made a provision for our salvation. And in fact, the gospel is the very heart of our message and our purpose. It's our reason for existence. 
In order for us to effectively communicate salvation, we must understand how it works, why it's necessary, and what mankind must do in order to receive it. And once we completely believe it, then we can communicate it to other people, which is what we refer to as sharing the gospel. Now last week we looked at several challenges that Paul issued to Titus on the importance of character in order to build a healthy church. This week we'll look at salvation and how essential it is for building character in a healthy church, as well as the authority by which Titus and his fellow pastors should preach. This is the church of Jesus Christ. The truth about his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection is the bond that we all have in common. Yet the founders of this particular church on this particular corner named her Grace, which is an incredibly appropriate name for a Christian gathering place. The grace of God is where the story of salvation begins. You may recall from a Sunday school class many years ago that grace is best defined as unmerited favor. And it depicts how true believers in Jesus Christ have received that undeserved favor from God by dying to our selfish ambitions, by being willing to die for the sake of the cause, and by walking in obedience to his teachings. We submit our lives to the Lordship that he has, that he has, that he deserves, and we follow him in this life in order to spend eternity with him in heaven. It is the greatest news available in an era where the, the news is geared to regulate panic and anger rather than undeserved favor and the forgiveness of sins. Now let's look at verse 11 and we'll, we'll see about accepting the presence of salvation. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men. Now let me, this is another one of those verses that you, you know every one of these words, if you blow past this real quickly, you've missed something. There's a lot packed in a very short little powerful statement here. Now he's just referred to, as we saw last week, he's given us kind of broken things down, older men, older women, younger men, younger women, and so that pretty much covers all of us, right? But if you recall, he has just referred to God in verse 10 as our Savior, which we've seen before and is not rare, but almost every reference to the Savior is directed to the person of Jesus. But as we've noted, since they are one and the same, it's certainly acceptable to use either. God was the author of salvation while Jesus was the agent of salvation. Now, this is a powerfully concise statement that involves some considerable theological depth. Often we refer to God's grace in an intangible fashion. We will say things like, God gives grace to the humble, right? We didn't make that up. We pulled that out of the Bible. Yet here, it keeps an intangible sense, but it's also suggested in a quite tangible way. In the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God is now seen in the flesh and having returned to heaven. Now, people occasionally ask about this business of salvation for all men. <coughs> Did Jesus die for everyone in the world? Did Jesus die for unbelievers? Now, the expression basically refers to the fact that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But not everyone will be saved. So don't read this and come away with universalism. Don't read this and say that we're all going to go to heaven when we die. There will be those who tragically reject or ignore the claims of Christ to be the sinless sacrifice of God for the redemption of of the sins of mankind. Without surrendering to Jesus as Lord of our lives, we will simply not receive the forgiveness of our sins. 
Salvation has been made available to everyone, rich or poor, young or old, male or female, whatever color, whatever education level, whatever political leanings, it doesn't matter. Salvation has been made available to everyone. This is a universal offer to come to Christ. And it is not the conclusion that everyone will receive Christ. Yet this grace that I just mentioned is not just a warm and fuzzy wish. The Greek word charis means gift. The saving grace of God is a free gift. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. You can't buy it. When Jesus became human at the first Christmas, God's eternal plan of salvation was put into place. Those who receive him and surrender to him as Lord of their lives will experience the salvation from their sins. When we see the phrase, has appeared, it refers to coming into light, especially as something which had been previously unnoticed has now been made clear. When Jesus came to earth, he brought God's saving purpose from being unseen to being clear and evident. <clears throat> Jesus is not only God incarnate, but he is also grace incarnate. He is love incarnate. He is kindness incarnate. The incarnation is the finest example of love. It is the focal point of worship. It is the turning point of time. It is the highest point of love, but it is the starting point of salvation. Salvation is necessary due to mankind's disobedience to God and the curse that accompanied that disobedience, which broke our heavenly fellowship, and required supernatural repair. Yet we must state the obvious here, that we are saved by grace. We are saved by the grace of God from the wrath of God. The righteous judge will only condemn to hell those people who reject or ignore his plan of salvation. Thus, we are saved from the reality of what our sinfulness deserves, which is eternity in the torment of hell. God's grace provides an escape for those who put their lives in his control. Let's look at verse 12. We'll see about the denying the pull of sin. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So he's continuing this thought. But now that the basics of salvation have been established, Paul focuses the rest of this passage on being saved while on earth from the grips of sin. He spends much more space detailing this in, in the book of Romans. But for our purposes here, we'll just look at these next few verses. The word here for instructing is where we get English words such as discipling, nurturing, educating. Having been revealed in Jesus, God's sovereign grace can be seen for both salvation on how to get into heaven and education as to how to live on earth that would please God. When we were saved, we entered a position where we could know about God by reading his word that was illuminated by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, theology can be quite confusing. Paul makes the comment in 1 Corinthians that to the natural man, these things are foolishness. They cannot understand them because these things, without the Spirit of God, you cannot understand these things because they are spiritually appraised. Thus we can see the difference between salvation and sanctification. With salvation we are saved from the penalty of sin as well as the bondage to sin. With sanctification the Spirit creates spiritual development in us. Since we have been released from sin's grip, the result will be visible evidence of His new, holy, and righteous nature. You simply can't have one without the other. You can't be sanctified unless you've first been saved. Since we have gone from an old creature to a new creature, 
when we trusted in Christ alone for salvation, believers have been redirected from sin toward righteousness as a result of the gracious, gracious instruction of believers. When we see the word ungodliness, think of a total disregard toward the things of God. Then you combine that with the fact that worldly desires describes a passion for the pleasures the world can offer, and you have a great summary of what we are to say no to. Don't limit this to major sins like murder or armed robbery. This could be just about any type of immorality. But when the second idea comes to play, it involves the things that we would be tempted to do, and even though we may not succumb to that temptation, our hearts long for the experience anyway. And here's the problem with this tandem. Once we have been saved, His grace makes ethical demands on us. Grace teaches and enables us to reject non-Christ-like activities. In other words, the Spirit of God gives the people of God the ability to recognize the things to which he or she should set affections and which things should be summarily rejected. Grace doesn't mean that we can do whatever we want. Grace means we know what pleases God and we obey it. Now let's look at verse 13 and we'll see how, about seeking the presence of of the Redeemer, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Still in, in mid-thought here. True believers are anticipating the second coming of Jesus, which will be the appearing of the glory of God. Did you catch that? The verse says the appearing of the glory. And that provides the motivation we may need for righteous living as he's just described. The hope that we have that creates a great expectation allows us to live each day with the moral and the ethical balance that he requires of us. The word, therefore, looking for provides a patient tension of that unfulfilled expectation. It's almost like the old Heinz ketchup commercials. You're anticipating it. It's coming. You know it's going to come. You're just not exactly sure when. So we're looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. At this point in time, it's an expectation. The term there, blessed hope, indicates the reasonable manifestation of our faith. Now, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are, of all men, most to be pitied. Our hope is in the resurrection. Because He lives, you and I, and everyone who trusts in Him, will live again and will live eternity in His presence. It's a powerful thing, and it is our hope, the appearing of the, of the glory of our great God and Savior. And at the moment of this appearing, those of us who are alive at the time will see our faith become sight this side of heaven. And he concludes his thought by repeating the notion that Jesus is God. They are separate, they are equal. Three persons, one essence. It's the Trinity. Jesus is God because God is the author of salvation. Jesus is the agent upon whom we place our faith and the manifestation which turns faith into fact. And we've seen this in other places that the Greek word for hope carries with it the essence of our word anticipation. But let's look quickly at the benefits of the return of the Lord. First, the presence of Jesus, who loved us and gave himself for us, whether in heaven or on earth, would provide the ultimate joy for the believer. The second, 
we have been set free from the bondage to sin, but at Christ's return, or upon our glorification in heaven, we will no longer have sin to deal with. And won't that be great? As we just described, whether they were sins committed or sins not committed yet craved, we will no longer have to be bothered in this way. Whew. Finally, when the created order is restored, the image of God will be realized in the lives of true believers. Verse 14, we'll, we'll see about submitting to the plan of redemption. Verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us. We just saying, redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. To redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. There's a lot to, packed in that one as well. The great God and Savior Christ Jesus, for whom all true believers wait, is the same Jesus Christ who was born in the humility of the manger and was executed in the humiliating fashion of the Roman cross. Paul's words make it clear here that this act was one of selfless sacrifice, indicating that the work was completely voluntary. It is a great example of the New Testament Greek word for love, which is called agape. Now let's see two distinct purposes of God in this verse. First, we see clearly that we've been set free from bondage to our sin here, that Christ died in our place. The word, therefore, redeem means to purchase release from captivity. It was often used with slaves, but it was also occasionally used in a ransom situation. Thus, we have been set free from the flesh-driven, natural man status and placed in an environment where we seek more passionately to do Christ-like things, thinking of the benefit of others rather than self. For the skeptic or the seeker, however you want to refer to that person, personal flesh is the dominant factor in all decisions. The second purpose behind his sacrifice is that he would set a special people apart for himself. Now, nobody, as you've likely figured out by now, is born holy. But true believers have been made holy as a result of the high dollar seminary word, imputation. It's the transfer of Christ's holiness onto our account. Now this clearly has an Old Testament aroma to it, but it is clearly New Testament in thought. The redeemed church is God's people today. Now, if you want to study more on this in Romans 9 to 11, it, it, Paul goes on into more detail about how the church will be grafted into Israel. But don't let people say, or don't let anybody convince you that the church has completely and permanently replaced Israel because this is just a temporary status. It's fun for those of us who like to think that way. It's just not biblical. <laughs> Nevertheless, God has set apart people who have trusted in Christ alone for salvation. And before we move to the final verse, there's another point for consideration. This purification process is called sanctification, which is not a word that, that we're going to use every day. But the, the New Testament writers used it a dozen times. Remember, we're no longer in bondage to sin. But we are also not held responsible for the sins of the past. Are you with me on this? This becomes very important to us. I've shared the gospel with a fellow who uh, had passed away about this time last year. And I'm telling you, we were, we were this close. And he, he looked at me and said, you just don't know the bad things that I've done. And I said, well, you just don't know how deep his love is, yeah. how broad his forgiveness reaches. And it's a strange thing for somebody whose past is checkered. Mm 
to understand that God wipes all that clean. It sounds cliche, but it's not. It doesn't matter what you've done. It does not matter. I'm telling you, I have done prison revivals before. And you go, if anybody understands sin, it's those guys. And if there's anybody who understands the need for forgiveness, it's those guys. And you can see it in their face. I've killed people. I don't deserve the forgiveness of God. If that's the case, you're short-selling the forgiveness of God because he will forgive anything, whether it's, whether it's murder, whether it's armed robbery, whatever it is, he'll cover it. I mean, Scripture is full of instances where murderers <laughs> become saints because of the grace of God. The death sentence of sin has been pardoned for one reason and only one reason, his love for us. Positionally, then, we, we are properly aligned with God regardless of how rotten we have behaved in the past. We are free from the punishment of sin and we are free from its influence as the purification process takes place. I've shared the gospel with people who say, well, you know, I've run with this same crowd for the, the longest period of time. I just can't shake it. You're not set apart. If you've been saved. If you have come to him, you have sought the forgiveness of sins that he will set you apart. But again, you can't have one without the other. Think of it like this. Redemption takes care of yesterday while purification allows today and tomorrow to be reasons for eternal gratitude for that redemption. Listen, I've never committed murder. I've never committed armed robbery. I've done some really bad stuff. I'm glad, I am thankful for the fact that His grace covers everything that I've ever done and everything that I ever will do. Amen. So you must also understand the importance of the phrase zealous good deeds. And as it's written here, this is the reason for sanctification. Clearly here, good works are the effect of salvation and not the cause. If we seek God's will, it could be found in following Christ's selfless example and living for the benefit of others. What a great way for Jesus to be welcomed back to earth is to see his people living like him. Let's look at verse 15, where he's talking about speaking the power of with authority. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Now, this verse is the clearest declaration that we have in Scripture of how men whom God calls to minister are enabled to speak with spiritual authority. The word for authority translates something that is in its proper place. It was used figuratively as a command. And as a verb, it was used to describe Jesus' authority over demons and the wind in the gospel accounts. Paul often refers to his apostolic authority. Look at Philemon. And some of you just probably just have to look over the next page. Philemon verse 8. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. Since I am such a person, and he goes on, I'll, I'll stop it there. But when he says these things, 
He's referring to what we saw last week in verses 1 to 10 of chapter 2. Titus was to speak and to exhort and to reprove. Listen, this is a great summary of how to be a pastor. You speak, you exhort, you reprove. Again, some of those are not words we use every day. Some of them are. But love had kept Paul from playing the card of his authority. So here he is with Philemon. And you remember the story about the runaway slave Onesimus and how he's trying to appeal to get him back and, and some things like that. And he says, what he's saying basically, as I just read to you that verse from Philemon, what he's saying is, because I am the Apostle Paul, <laughs> I can order you to do this. So he's speaking with authority. He chooses not to play that card, though. So love keeps him from playing it. But the point is that he had it to play. He had that authority. Now, there's some extensive work that could be done here because this is similar phraseology to what we see in the interfaces between Jesus and the Pharisees as they question his authority. But we don't have time for that. But think about it for a second and then dial back to the first century. Jesus of Nazareth, the author of Scripture, the person who put creation in its place, had no man-designed, man-ordained, let, let me just colloquialize it, had no seminary degree. Why? He wrote the books! <laughs> There's no diploma. There's no license. There's no ordination. Listen. John 7, 16. So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. Thus the authority with which the sinless and perfect Son of God spoke while on earth was nothing except the truth of the revealed word of God. Following his example, the only way anyone should preach today is under the authority of divine scripture. No pastor has authority of any sort outside of God's word. As long as the pastor is true to the word of God, he has the awesome privilege of ministering with God-given authority. His goal is not to share personal insights. We saw many of these admonitions from Paul in his letters to Timothy, and you might also remember the clear and succinct challenge to preach the word. He doesn't say to preach stories that, that might be seasoned with the word. He says preach the word. It's tragic to hear the false teachers of today claim to have authority over disease and poverty and attempt to claim authority based on the fact that they call on Jesus' name that some miracle might occur. But rather we should pray for God's will to be done and realize that the only power of the pastor is in Scripture itself. Once we're willing to humbly and submissively approach and to accept God's will in accordance to his word, then his people can accomplish much. But it must always be intended for his glory and not our own. And we can also run into problems when certain men hide behind the cloak of a particular church or denomination. There is no authority in a church or a collection of churches regardless of how lar large it is. We've talked about this with the Pharisees. They, they were, had convinced themselves that they were going to heaven because they were Jewish. You just can't find anything about that in Scripture. You cannot find that you're going to go to heaven because you're a member of Grace Community Baptist Church, as sad as that may sound. What that means is you, you go to heaven because you have surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You've trusted in Him alone for salvation. Now we can also run into problems when pastors believe that our creativity is necessary to make God's word relevant. Boy, that irritates me when I hear that. It's true that mankind is created in the image of God. 
But any kind of intellectual prowess is a gift from above and it's incapable of attracting people to Christ. Persuasive eloquence and emotional appeals can influence people to make decisions for Christ, but generally cannot make disciples. Men who trust in their own intellect are asking for problems. One final set of problems stemmed from experience. Many believers make decisions based on the way they feel. Feeling and emotion cannot discern truth and actually have no relation to truth. There is no reliability and certainly no authority behind emotion and feelings. Pastors should try their best to keep themselves out of their sermons in order for the voice of God to be the only one heard. Now that doesn't mean that at times we use personal illustrations to highlight or to illustrate a difficult part of scripture, but that should be the exception rather than the rule. Yet make no mistake about it, we are to preach the word authoritatively because the word itself is the authority, not the pastor. The word here for exhort carries the idea of pleading, yet reprove is a negative command that means to convince and correct one who has yet to recognize that his or her behavior or belief is wrong. The preacher must make clear that his goal is to bring his listeners to understand, to trust, and obey the truth of God's word. The word here for disregard means to think around something for the purpose of evasion. And we've all disobeyed God by trying to think around him or to mentally justify some bad behavior. But there are no exceptions here. No one is to disregard the pastor who is delivering God's message. Paul gives Titus here a gateway into church discipline. That's how serious this final charge is. God has given us his plan of salvation to redeem sinners, and we're all sinners. And we can trust in that redemption, and we can preach it with authority. If you're here this morning, and you've never accepted God's plan to save you from your sin, I pray that you will do so, even now. Would you pray with me, please? Father, in the stillness of this moment, we ask that you draw your net. We pray, Father, that if there's anyone here who wants, needs to do business with you, that now will be the accepted time. For now is the accepted time. Today is the day for your salvation. Father, we just pray that you will give us a sense, a renewed sense of your Lordship on our lives. Holy Spirit, breathe on us in this place. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Mark and Taylor are here. They're going to lead us in a verse or two of a hymn of invitation. If there's anything you need to talk about, I'll be down front. If you need to join the church, if you want to need to come to Christ for the first time, we'll be down here. You can do business however you want to do business. While they play and they sing, you come. Page 312.